Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal, and we are continuing our special two-part series on the American Holocaust. Joining me as always is Jason Pentrail, my co-host, who is helping me with these introductions to this special series, which in truth, I feel Jason was kind of the mastermind behind. So welcome, we hope that you enjoyed episode one of our two-part series And looking ahead, we're about to get into truly, I think, an introspective and intellectual analysis of what we're talking about when we say, to borrow David Standard's terms, the American Holocaust, and talking with Dr. Samuel Zinner. Again, he is a professional Holocaust historian and multidisciplinary scholar and linguist. I don't think that there could have been a better person to give us perspectives on this. And Jason, there's a moment in the interview where he says, you know, we we are talking about things and we are addressing subjects and trying to wade our way through them. And there is not a complete data set or a full understanding of these things. I mean, we're kind of in virgin territory with some of this. And it was a very difficult discussion at times. It's one of those things that it's, it's very hard to get all of the details. It's very hard to wrap your mind around something of this magnitude. And, you know, something that we've tried to do here is get down to the raw, real human side of it and not just quote statistics after statistics, because it's much more than that. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those situations where we're dealing with so many different aspects. It's not just history, uh, but it's, you know, so many things, the social interaction between the aggressors and the victims and all of the things that happened uh, that ultimately led to what truly is a genocide that's been overlooked and more importantly uh, forgotten about by many people who live right here on the land where these atrocities occurred. So when we're trying to delve into this, we're not just giving you a history. We're not just trying to tell you what happened. We're trying to make sense of something that is so profoundly disturbing that it leads beyond just the average historical conversation, and it really goes down paths uh, that lead to you know the darkest parts of the human soul, and and you know it's it's expressions like that that we're not just using for drama or to build upon the gravity here. This is something that truly happened, and there's there's a reason why, and there's something about the human spirit, something about the human mind here that also needs to be explored. So our interview with Dr. Zinner is extremely in-depth. It's that way for a reason. So I urge you as you listen to this episode to be open-minded to what we're discussing and please afterwards reflect on it and, and spend some time really considering what we discuss in this interview. And with that, we present Dr. Samuel Zinner here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal.
Samuel Zinner, Ph.D., is a scholar of ancient and modern history, literatures, and linguistics, and a Holocaust researcher. Now, during his time at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Zinner concentrated in modern and ancient languages and literatures, history, and museum studies, with a further emphasis on archival studies. He's worked on projects funded by major grants, which include those from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Among his many writings, he was a contributor to Oxford, New York's German Scholars and Ethnic Cleansing, 1920-1945, which was awarded the American Library Association's prestigious Choice Outstanding Academic Book of the Year Award for the year of 2005. He's also contributed articles to Holocaust and Genocide Studies, a publication of Oxford University Press and other academic journals. His books and essays on ancient and modern history and literature have been published internationally in a variety of languages. And so I would like to begin by looking at the way that your historical research with regard to Holocaust pertains to this conversation by allowing you to talk a little bit about that. For those in the listening audience who aren't familiar with you and your work, that would be a good way to begin before we get into the discussion of how this pertains to the Native American issues in America today. Uh, My work in, in Holocaust studies covers about two or three main areas. After World War II, after the Holocaust, uh, when it came to the issue of criminal culpability right, for the Holocaust, uh, usually the so-called higher-ups uh, were always identified. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Goebbels, Hitler, of course, and, and his henchmen. So blame was always uh, assigned to those who were high up. After um, a little bit of time passed, then it was uh, began to filter down, right? Or it's the SS, uh, members of the SS, and the SS execution squads. These were the ones who were the real perpetrators of the Holocaust, right? Uh, that was done in a way to exonerate the average German soldier in the army. Uh, as Holocaust studies began to develop right, over the decades uh, after World War II, uh, we begin to see a trend, right, that uh, the more one plows into the actual archival evidence, the more one realizes that the so-called uh, Nazi machinery of death right, uh, would have been impossible if not for the contributions of uh, people working uh, at some of the lowest levels in different professions. For instance, you had to have people sitting down making maps filling out cards, registering names of Jews, names of Roma and Sinti, the so-called gypsies, names of other so-called undesirables. And so it just wasn't the people on top. And the machinery of death would not have been possible also without uh, the people working at the train stations. Right? And I don't have to go into the details about that. I'm sure, sure you know what I'm implying. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's where uh, a lot of my work has focused on some of these lower-level professions without which the uh, Holocaust could not have been realized on a practical level. Uh, The other area, I'm also very interested in in the Wannsee Conference, which was uh, a major uh, conference of Nazi leaders uh, at a place called Wannsee, and they planned uh, further coordination for the extermination of Jews throughout the entire world. And... Uh, there have been two movies made about this. Uh, I believe both are simply called Bonsai Conference. One was done by HBO, uh, one is a German-made movie. There were two representatives of Alfred Rosenberg at that conference. Alfred Rosenberg was the head of the Reich Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories, uh, Reichsministerium für die Besetzten Ostgebiete. He sent two representatives to the Bonsai Conference, Alfred Meyer and another gentleman named Georg Leibrandt. Now, Georg Leibrandt was put on trial after uh, the Holocaust, but he was exonerated 
And uh, these two movies portray him at the conference as not only a non-ideological Nazi, that is someone who probably was pretty mild, but even as someone who was opposed to the Holocaust. And what I uh, discovered, however, during archival research some years ago, was that he, uh, this Georg Leibrandt, was as rabid as anyone else, as, as rabid an um, um, anti-Semite as anyone else at that conference. Uh, and uh, I discovered that through a series of articles, dozens of articles that he published in the 1930s uh, in a Nazi journal. Later, a colleague of mine uh, and I documented how this Leibrandt character actually introduced the practice of gassing people in the East in the wake of Operation Barbarossa. The last thing I'll mention is the Roma and Sinti genocide, the so-called gypsies. Uh, it took several decades for focus right, to be put upon uh, these groups. Uh, f for some decades, most of the attention uh, was on what the Nazis had done to the Jews. Uh, it took some decades before uh, that focus was expanded right, uh, to include the Roma and the Sinti. And so uh, that, that's another area uh, that I work in. And my training, some of the, the most important influences uh, were, I'd have to say, Yehuda Bauer, one of the, the world's most prestigious Holocaust scholars. Also, Christopher Browning, uh, whose uh, book called Ordinary Men uh, was very enlightening. Ordinary Men uh, was about what were the SS members of these SS killing squads? What were they like? Right? And it turns out that studying these, it turns out they were all, quote unquote, ordinary men. Right? And uh, when all of the killing started, uh, many of them were having trouble uh, with uh, alcoholism. Because even for them, they found it very difficult psychologically to be killing uh, unarmed men, women, and children. A key finding in that book was that no one was ever punished for refusing orders to kill. If someone didn't want to kill and they protested and, and they decided not to do it, no one was uh, punished. So there can be no excuse. But those are the areas that I've worked in, in the Holocaust. Yeah. It has such relevance to what we're going to get into here with regard to Native American studies, because some of the questions that immediately come to mind, and I want to come back around to these, but when we sure. talk about the ordinary man factor, if you want to call it that, people taking orders, people carrying out atrocities, but doing so as part of a war effort where there is an ideology at work. I mean, I want to look at that in regard to colonialism in the New World. And the title of the book that this two-part series we're featuring on this edition of the podcast has relevance to is, of course, American Holocaust. And it was by mm. David Standard. Now, the term Holocaust used in the title has aroused some controversy. Can we talk a little bit about the reasons for that controversy and the scholarly debate in relation to that and its use with the title of the book we're discussing? Well, first of all, Standard has been clear. If he says the Holocaust, he is referring to the, the Nazi Holocaust, the Nazi genocide, principally against uh, Jews and then a Roman Sinti. And so when he uses it in the title, the American Holocaust, it, it is qualified. It's not, you know, carte blanche or, or unqualified. So he does make that distinction. He, he has discussed that. He's not uh, unaware or insensitive to this topic. Now, the reason it's so controversial, though, for many people, uh, is that in Holocaust studies, and what I mean by Holocaust studies is specifically the Nazi Holocaust, the dominant opinion and a very common trope that one hears is that the Holocaust, the Nazi Holocaust, is quote-unquote unique. And the insistence or the emphasis upon its uniqueness, right, um, when one uses the word Holocaust to describe other genocides, right, some uh, believe or feel that this is somehow diminishing right, the seriousness and the uniqueness uh, of the Nazi Holocaust. 
so it, there was uh, and continues to be some back and forth between Standard and some Holocaust scholars about this topic. Standard, I know, published one article uh, uh, with the title, um, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but uh, to the effect that it is dangerous right, to call the Holocaust unique. Now, here I would disagree with Standard. Uh, w w my take on this would be that uh, uh, as Yehudu Bauer himself uh, has explained, right? each genocide is unique in different ways. So what you have to do is you have to deal with each genocide individually and draw up a list, based on research of course, draw up a list of, well, what are the unique elements to this genocide, right, c c in contrast to or compared uh, to other uh, genocides. And the number one uh, unique uh, element that Yehuda Bauer uh, invokes for the Nazi Holocaust is uh, what he calls totality. And if you think of the Wannsee Conference, this plan to exterminate Jews on a worldwide basis, that's a pretty good diagnosis right, or description, this totality. Uh, but in any case, each genocide has unique characteristics that have to be identified by painstaking study. Right. And um, so I would not agree with Standard that it's quote-unquote dangerous to call the Holocaust unique. I would say each genocide can be called unique, and I think should be called unique, uh, because it lends a certain uh, even emotional weight, if you will, mm. uh, which I think is justified when, when you're dealing with such uh, horrific uh, topics. So I think each genocide is unique, and we have to identify uh, how so, right, for each one. I mean, we don't always have to do that in every conversation, but uh, it, certainly in a professional lecture or in a book, one would right, yeah. ha have to go through that and identify what it is at the time or still remains uh, unique about any particular Holocaust. Standards right. has also pointed out that the term Holocaust Right. It, it was actually used to describe the uh, Native American genocide already uh, in the 1800s, for instance. And of course, now Jews, and increasingly scholarship in general, prefers um, not to use uh, the word Holocaust for the Nazi uh, extermination uh, uh, right, of about six million Jews. We prefer the term Shoah, a Hebrew term, for a, a similar concept. I would say, to Holocaust. And as you point out, it's important to identify these things in scholarly research for the very same reason I wanted to be able to identify these things for our listenership on this podcast, because it's inevitably going to be an emotionally charged subject. You know, Dr. Zenner, there's so many points that you hit on there that I think is, is really important to the discussion. And the listeners may be wondering, you know, why are we dedicating so much uh, time and effort, you know, basically to semantics, as, I, as some would put it. And I think the reason being is, the word Holocaust is such a powerful word. So, you know, when we look at history, when we look at our daily lives, there are certain key terms that evoke a certain emotion, and Holocaust is certainly one of those. And I think one thing that I see that is a big problem when we're discussing Native American genocide is the lack of knowledge by the average citizen pertaining to that. And therefore, if you can attribute a word as powerful in emotional as Holocaust, it really kind of drives home the point to the, the average person that, yes, something to that magnitude did occur here in North America at some yes. point in time. And, you know, even when you go, for instance, to the University of Minnesota's Department of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, they do define Holocaust in, in the exact way that you referred to. It has a, a Nazi-led um, destruction of six million European Jews. Um, so they, again, define Holocaust by those specific terms. But I just want to drive that point to the listeners that the reason that we're focusing on this so much is because that word Holocaust immediately puts you in the mindset of those atrocities against the Jewish people during World War II. That yeah. same degree of emotion, however, seems to be lacking here in North America, where my interactions with people about this topic uh, most of the time they have no idea what I'm even referring to, or, or they have a very limited amount of knowledge about what actually occurred here in North America. We are trying to find the right term to apply 
to the destruction of the Native American cultures when we're seeing 90, 94, 95, 98 percent population lost in some cases, that requires the proper term. Well, I, I'm confident the standard uh, has hit on the right formula here uh, when he points out that he reserves the term the Holocaust right, for the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, and yet right, the, there is a justification for using the term Holocaust in a phrase like the American Holocaust, because there there's no confusion with the Nazi Holocaust. So you you get to use the term which is emotionally laden, right? Uh, And I think it's necessary to use emotionally laden terms. Um, And and they're they're laden with so much emotion because of the associations, right? Uh, Just as the word genocide, right, is, is an emotionally uh, laden word, but I think Holocaust uh, packs a little bit more uh, of a punch, uh, per- perhaps because of the generation uh, that I grew up in, uh, you know, which was one where television was populated uh, frequently with uh, Holocaust uh, documentaries and, and, and curriculum at school uh, that was sure to cover that topic. At the same time, there is quite a glaring difference between the awareness of the Nazi Holocaust and then in America, the awareness of what happened. What is the real history of the Native peoples there? In other words, the genocide, let's just say it bluntly. And it ranges from complete uh, ignorance uh, to denial, which can be willful or ignorant, of course. That type of ignorance, right, is also one of the justifications for standard writing the book that he wrote. I mean, it's absolutely something that has to be brought to the attention of people. And, uh, you know, in looking at this subject, again, one of the things that we want to get into with you, Dr. Zenner, is uh, the way that the lasting effects continue to affect and marginalize indigenous people uh, in America even today. Because although Standard's book looks at the history, and we've recently discussed this with Daniele Bellelli, in terms of you know the history, what exactly happened, and the magnitude and scope of it, uh, many of these problems continue to this day. So maybe we could get into a little of that also. Uh, how, when we look at the history of, of, again, European contact with indigenous people in America... And we, and, we, and we understand comprehensively the atrocities that occurred. How are people today of Native American heritage still affected by these things? Well, uh, I think you'd have to go, uh, let's try this, four or five uh, points. Let's go point by point. Sure. Uh, I think one, and let me preface this uh, by saying I'm not claiming to be a spokesman uh, for indigenous peoples. Uh, and first of all, I'd have to say you cannot generalize when you're talking about Uh, Native Americans or the indigenous peoples. There were something um, along the lines of, what, 500 or so uh, distinct peoples or tribes uh, in North America, right? And so there's such diversity there, you know, it's impossible to generalize. Now, uh, so I'm not uh, claiming to be a spokesman uh, for, for any particular indigenous group. Uh, I'm a scholar. I, one of my great-grandmothers was enrolled in the uh, Iroquois nation. Uh, and that's, uh, of course, had a profound influence on my way of thinking and, and looking at life, I think. Uh, but uh, I do not, I, I myself am not enrolled in, in any tribe, although uh, some f- family members you know, have sought to be re-enrolled. Mm-hmm. So I'm just coming at this as a scholar who has, I would say, some family background, as opposed to rumor, something that's a, a person who's actually enrolled right. and, and uh, have the enrollment card still. Uh, but in any case, all right, having said that, one of the enduring effects of the, the genocide against Native Americans, I think, is, is the continued denial that there was a genocide. And th- this might be a good time, to, if you can, if I'm not surprising you no. uh, too suddenly here, to run that uh, the first soundbite that I sent you, because that will perfectly illustrate my point. Absolutely. And I believe this is uh, Dinesh D'Souza on Fox News, correct? Yes. Yeah, a little bit of background. So this was in a conversation, I believe, with Bill Ayers and Megyn Kelly. And what you're about to hear is D'Souza give an explanation for the reason in his uh, perspective uh, for the death of so many Native Americans, 
post-Columbian contact. As you can probably guess, he makes an argument that it had less to do with people killing and more to do with the spread of disease. We'll play that audio. Let's look at genocide. The American Indian population shrunk by 80 percent over 150 years. The, the main reason for that was not because of warfare or, or systematic killing. It's because the white man brought with him from Europe diseases to which Many the Native Americans, hold on, yeah. did not have any immunities. Yeah. And so they perished in large numbers. Now, the Europeans, uh, one third of the population of Europe a hundred years later was earlier had been wiped out by the Black Plague. Where did that come from? Asia. So with the migration of peoples, diseases go from civilization to civilization. That's not genocide. Genocide is when you intend to wipe out the people. They intended to wipe out the people and steal their land, and they did both. Right. Now, th this is a perfect example of the, the enduring effects of the genocide of Native Americans. Uh, just as you have revisionist historians who will deny uh, or diminish the Nazi Holocaust, you have people like this uh, gentleman, right, spouting th these, uh, I, I don't know what to call it, if it's complete ignorance, or uh, if there's ill will, I don't know. I, I can't get inside his mind. But there is no scholar, to my awareness, uh, who deals with the Native American genocide, who is unaware of the, the devastation caused by these diseases right. Right, that this gentleman is, is talking about. Right? Now, uh, if you turn to page 54 in the American Holocaust by Stannard, uh, quote, Right, the worst series of human disease. He, he refers to the worst series of human disease disasters, mm -hmm. combined with the most extensive and most violent programs of human eradication that this world has ever seen. Right, so it's not one or the other. Uh, it's uh, of course the, the, there was uh, unbelievable population loss uh, on account of these these diseases that were uh, brought in. Uh, but, right, that's not the whole story. There's also uh, the, the war, the slavery, and the genocide, and the massacres, right? Uh, th this is completely left in silence uh, in, in that soundbite, mm -hmm. right? And also, we're not talking about uh, migration, this word migration that that person uses. We're not talking about migration. We're talking about an invasion accompanied by genocide. Big now, difference. Uh, even if it's even if it uh, was unintended, right? Mass death, right? From from this type of disease, right? To me, it would seem to right raise the the question of uh, culpability, right? We, we, in law, uh, we make distinctions, of course, between murder, manslaughter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I dare say that if you or I completely unintentionally caused even a single person to die from a disease. I, probably feel guilty probably the rest of our lives i, I know i i would oh, yeah right? or, or if you hit someone in a car and you in, you know by accident uh, they're walking on the street uh, it's just it's just horrific to think about even just one individual right uh, be uh, and that loss being totally unintentional uh, but you know there's a good quote from from russell thornton right? he, he wrote uh, an american indian holocaust and survival uh, this is a population history since 1492. So it's, it's a serious scientific demographic study and right? it was published in 87 by the University of Oklahoma Press. Right? There's a good quote that I've selected here. Uh, uh, quote, given the tremendous destruction of Eastern American Indians during the 16th and 17th centuries, one might suppose that the colonists viewed it with some alarm or guilt. After all, they were the ones responsible directly or indirectly, intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah. On the contrary, the 200-year American Indian depopulation was often considered a blessed event by colonists. The maxim that the only good Indian was a dead one characterized relations between the whites and Indians in British North America from the beginning of colonial times. They even thought it the work of their God, uh, unquote. Right. So uh, the, the, the type of claims right, that the, the, the American Indians, right, uh, th these drastic depopulation experiences were, were simply the result of unintended, right, uh, the, the unintended effects of diseases uh, is very offensive. That claim is very offensive if you don't follow that up with the fact of all of the, the violence. 
right, and the genocide uh, that also was responsible uh, for the for depopulation. But overall, there there was an, uh, just an unimaginable decrease in the indigenous population. It would have been apocalyptic in their experience. Dr. Zinner, to hit on two of those points, you know, one is the soundbite. Uh, what he's describing there, you know, making it sound as if, well, it was an accidental thing. They came over and the disease is spread. Well, we know that once they figured out that these uh, indigenous people didn't have the immunity to the diseases, that they weaponized that and they used that itself as a weapon. And on top of that, you know, to disregard the blatant um, aggression, if you will, toward the indigenous people, um, you know, I, I don't want to overburden the listener with quotes, but I think it's very important here to quote directly Andrew Jackson, who said, quote, my original convictions upon this subject have been confirmed by the course of events for several years and experience is every day adding to their strength that those tribes cannot exist surrounded by our settlements and in continual contact with our citizens is certain they have neither the intelligence, the industry the moral habits, nor the desire of improvement, which are essential to any favorable change in their condition, established in the midst of another and superior race, and without appreciating the causes of their inferiority or seeking to control them, they must necessarily yield to the force of circumstances and ere long disappear. Andrew Jackson. Unbelievable. Uh, we, we could multiply that, right, with, with quotes from D D Thomas Jefferson. Oh, yeah. Now, I, I would add, too, that uh, in relation to the, the disease, right, and the, the demographic devastation caused by the European diseases that, that were introduced uh, into the Americas, right, that <sighs> there's a, a, another a factor that's usually overlooked. And as I've read from uh, Thornton, it was very rare for anyone, uh, for, for any of these, uh, what I would just call invaders, for these Europeans to feel guilt. Uh, there, are, uh, there are some records right, uh, about guilt once seeing uh, th th this devastation from, from disease. But uh, also, sure, uh, it, it's just an unimaginable number that would have died from these diseases. On the other hand, as standard, so well documents, we have uh, written records right, by, by some of the Spaniard authorities from their own pens documenting how they killed, and they literally refer to killing with the sword and, and other means, millions, millions Right? And then we have a plethora of accounts of various Europeans of committing massacres in the tens of thousands. So uh, even if we want to say, all right, th th there's nothing, uh, how, could they be, how, how could these settlers be culpable? Right? Uh, how could they have known about amoebas? Right? That's one thing you frequently hear. Right. How, how could they have known what, what, would, what was going to happen right, when they brought these diseases over? And so we, we shouldn't be blaming them for something they weren't aware of. But, uh, even if we grant that, you cannot ignore right, the, the fact that the perpetrators themselves right, have left records documenting uh, the, the killing of tens of thousands in many cases, and also in several cases, of millions of indigenous peoples. Their own documentation, too. Yes. Britain wasn't as good as the Spanish uh, authorities. The, the, the Spaniards early on uh, were very meticulous about keeping you know, all kinds of uh, these types of records. And we have it from the, many of their pens, and, uh, and they're documented, they're quoted in, in standard, you know, that they killed millions, uh, and not through disease. Of course, millions did die from disease. But these, what I'm referring to, are, are these documents uh, s stating that, you know, we killed millions of these indigenous people. Millions. Yeah, that absolutely can't be overlooked, although, as you've eloquently put it, I mean, it continually is overlooked. Coming back to the idea of the ordinary man, 
and this fundamental to your own research with regard to Holocaust studies. Jason, I know that you've had this question, too. We look at time and time again the accounts of the blood lost in the kinds of written records left primarily by the Spanish that you're referencing, Dr. Zenner. And, and what we're left with is trying to understand, okay, how does a person get into a mode where they see another being, a human being, and and they can justify, you know, making claims like testing the the uh, sharpness of their blade by slicing children in half, you know, or cutting off appendages of people, leaving the the hands dangling by the skin, and sending them off as a warning to others. They justify this kind of behavior in a variety of ways. But again, as we see, there are people who leave written accounts, and some express guilt, but many do not. How do they yeah, justify? Most do not. Most do not. Now, how do we justify that or reconcile that psychologically? Oh, this is explained through the dehumanization uh, of these peoples. For instance, the Nazis in their propaganda leading up to the Holocaust, right, had, had all of these film strips that many of us have seen, of course, right, uh, depicting uh, Jews and explicitly calling them vermin, right? So you drill this in uh, into the consciousness of an entire generation, especially of the youth, and eventually you dehumanize uh, the target group. And so then it makes it somewhat easier uh, to, to treat them as as non-human, right? Uh, but there will always be uh, those that will find it difficult, the different degrees right, uh, of psychological uh, difficulty that, that uh, will be experienced by those who undertake the murder, right, uh, of the target group. For instance, as I mentioned, as Christopher Browning documented, there's, uh, the, the SS squads, uh, the, the alcoholism was rampant, right? They, 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 had, they had to become drunk, right, to many of them, uh, to, to carry out these, these uh, shootings, right, uh, filling up these pits. And now, with uh, the, the indigenous peoples, what uh, was the ideology there, right, that was used to dehumanize the indigenous peoples, because the same, the, basically the same formula uh, that was used, uh, only that in this case, uh, right, it, the Christian theology played a huge role, right, because the, the, these were non-Christians, they were subhumans, they were like animals, uh, and even by, there was even the concept that even by blood, right, that they're subhuman. Right. Right. And so, again, it's the dehumanization of the target group. And in the, the case of, the, uh, of Native Americans, indigenous peoples, the doctrine was often based on Christian theology uh, or some warped uh, version thereof. But in any case, it was the Christian theology of that era. Right. You know, something that uh, Standard actually points out in the book, he actually touches on uh, toward, I believe, the end of the fifth chapter uh, in the second portion of the book, the idea that for the second coming to come about, we have two options, essentially. We can convert people to Christianity, or we can rid the world of those who will not convert, and that way all the world can you know, take up the faith and thereby, thereby facilitate the second coming. And he specifically points out Columbus, prior to his arrival in what he believed was the West Indies, knew this. Uh, we also know that the royalty in, in Spain knew this, that they were aware of these kinds of things, and that inevitably those that ideological perspective fueled some of the atrocity that followed. Even if during initial contact, Columbus didn't come out with quote-unquote guns blazing, it eventually occurred nonetheless. And we saw that same sort of ideology, I think, carried through for centuries thereafter in North America. Friedlander, Henry Friedlander explicated Th this point, that any genocide uh, seems to be realized on the basis of two factors, uh, ideology and uh, unfolding dynamics of a concrete situation. And you, find, you find that in uh, the Nazi Holocaust as well. There was, from the beginning, an ideology in place, but by itself it was not sufficient to carry out the actual Holocaust. What had to happen is that the war started, or Hitler started the war, uh, right? And then specific concrete events unfolded that facilitated the carrying out of some of that earlier ideology. So it's always a combination of the ideology and unfolding factors on the ground. 
right? That's the case with the Nazi Holocaust, the case with the Armenian genocide. And I think that that explains what you had just mentioned about Christopher Columbus. There was some ideology there, but he didn't get off the boat and start uh, slaying people. Right. Why? Because uh, mass murder also requires not only ideology, but certain events that begin to unfold on the ground. And the two put together, right, then become the deadly combination. As I mentioned before, the Christian theology played a role in the dehumanization of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Mm-hmm. And this uh, is part of what enables or makes possible the actual murder, mass murder, uh, of human beings. But if you think largely, that can also uh, be, that paradigm uh, also applies to the Nazi Holocaust because two millennia, nearly two millennia, of Christian ideology, Christian theology, right? Uh, it, it did not directly cause the Holocaust, but a good argument, many Holocaust scholars would claim that a good argument can be made that it certainly was a contributing factor. Right? The, the supersessionism is called, and, and some of the anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism uh, that you find in some versions, or most versions of, uh, of Christian theology, certainly played a role right, in forming and shaping the world that gave rise uh, to, to Nazi Germany. So in, in different ways, I think, uh, but still, uh, Christian theology did play a role in both of these uh, genocides. Specifically, I think uh, to, it was used and invoked in order to dehumanize different groups, because the Jews were dehumanized right, by the idea that, well, they're Christ killers, they're, you know, they're, they're deicides, they're God killers, they're Christ killers, and they're subhuman. There's something inferior in their blood, right? Mm. Uh, and and by that time, right, you, you've degenerated really into into racial theory and racism into racism. Yeah, but, but that's a hell of an interesting yeah. corollary, though. Yeah, well, yes, but I, I think it's really inescapable. Yeah. Um, of course, you have to make all sorts of qualifications, and I'm and I'm not here to to demonize uh, Christianity as such. Sure. I mean, e- even from a rabbinic perspective, right? I think Maimonides, right, uh, one of the greatest rabbinic theologians of, of, of all time, right? Uh, right. Even though, of course, he, he, he did not accept Christian theology, didn't accept the claims that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Nevertheless, right, Maimonides and others, uh, other Jewish authorities, some of the greatest authorities in, in Jewish theology have recognize and have right promoted this concept that well uh that judea that excuse me christianity and islam are providential movements so that they you can they can even judaism can see the hand of god in those religions they have a part to play in spreading monotheism so uh so even rabbinic judaism would not completely Right, be negative about Christianity. There, there's something there that can be said in a positive role. But uh, the negative part, uh, you know, historically viewed, uh, and the role that Christian theology played right, in, in, in forming these ideologies that dehumanized first the, the Native Americans and then later the, the Jews. I, I I think it's it's well nigh impossible to, to deny that. Absolutely, no. That's that's incredibly important to me in this entire thing because I mean it really unites the perspectives on what is a Holocaust and what are the motivations, the fundamental motivations that drive a genocide, basically in 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 total. And uh, it's not to say, of course, like that Christianity does that by any means. It, it is to say that an ideological perspective. Uh, which we could we could liken to Christianity or any number of things, but certainly with regard to colonial uh, arrival in the New World, and specifically with relation to the demonization well, of. To, yes, to be objective, one would have to say that it was we're talking about the actual Christianity of a particular time period. Yeah, because uh, many Christians will immediately get defensive and say, well, that's a perversion of Christianity, perversion of Christ's teaching. Well, it may be, it may not be. But what we can agree on is that, well, that was the Christian thinking in the real world at that time. And that cannot be denied. Right. 
You know, that actually hits on a really good point, Dr. Zinner. And, you know, I just want to go ahead and, and roll with this because there are many people who say that we as modern historians and people looking back at these subjects, there's, there is an argument that says that those people should be judged in their own time and that it's not appropriate to uh, judge them with our today's modern moral standards. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that is an argument that I've had presented to me before. Um, someone said, hey, well, you know, it was horrible and, and atrocities happened, but it's not fair for us to put our modern moral standards on them at that time. So what are your thoughts on that? Atrocities still happen today. Exactly. You understand what I'm, my point there mm-hmm. is the, 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 that argument that, that you're conveying from these other people, right, is, is spacious, right, because atrocities still happen. And what are we going to say? Well, you can't judge today's people by today's standards? Right, exactly. But There's all it's, sorts of ways that uh, some people out there belittle people of former ages, and we, we don't uh, give them the, the credit that they uh, deserve, right, whether it has to do with their propensity for good or evil. Uh, people were more sophisticated than a lot of people give them credit for. Whether it's this ancient alien silliness, right? They can't believe that ancient Egyptians actually could build pyramids, uh, or um, you know that well, the ancient uh, you know uh, pre-modern peoples didn't know about amoebas and and how disease transfers, right? Uh, as if there was no ancient science of medicine at all, uh, right? Uh, or Whatever, there's all sorts of these these uh, arguments, and some of them are purely based in ignorance, and others might have you know more of a insidious uh, basis to it, more of a willful uh, basis to it. Yes. But, but, but what I mean by that is, for instance, revisionist Holocaust revisionist historians yeah. usually know what they're doing; they know better. There's they an know agenda. The Holocaust did happen, mm-hmm. and yeah. yet for whatever reason. Eh, they want to deny it or, or belittle it or diminish it in some way. Absolutely. Agenda-driven. That's right. Motivation. And same thing with uh, the, the, the Fox News interview uh, that, that we heard. I, I don't want to take sides, you know, be pro-Republican or Democrat, but I want to equally uh, denounce both sides, yeah. if you see what I'm saying. Well, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. Insofar as some people in those camps do promote these uh, th- th- these ignoble statements and attitudes you know we had previously discussed with uh daniele Bellelli and he'd given us our his thoughts on it and i, I just want to while we have this opportunity i, I just want to dig a little bit deeper here because i think when we get into the truth of genocide and the truth of holocaust i think what happens is when you you give the statistics whether it be the jewish holocaust in world war ii or the native americans or any other rwanda or any other genocides that have occurred throughout the world eventually it gets so overwhelming with the statistics you know thousands dead millions dead that you get to a point that as a listener and a researcher and someone who's studying these things you can't process any more of that information it becomes too overwhelming And so I think it's vitally important to understand a genocide, to get down to the human level. And, you know, as we're describing, whether it be religious fervor, whether it be dehumanizing, seeing, in this case, the indigenous people of North America, Central America, South America as savages and paganistic and hedonistic and whatever it was that was ascribed to them in order to dehumanize them. When we get down to the human level, something that I can never seem to get past is, you know, okay, so you, you're going to kill a large group of people for a political cause, a religious cause, whatever it is. That's one thing. But it almost seems that when this starts occurring, that there's some sort of animalistic, sociopathic tendencies that take over. And uh, a good example is what I mean is... Um, Sand Creek, okay, we talked about that with Daniele Bellelli, but that is such a profound event that happened in North America, and the descriptions that come from that are something that just boggles the mind, uh, because it's beyond, it's well beyond just getting rid of someone, and and so I turn to first-hand accounts here, here's two very brief ones, but uh, Ashbury Bird, Company D of the 1st Colorado Calvary at Sand Creek states, I went over the ground soon after the battle. I should judge there were between 400 and 500 Indians killed. 
Nearly all men, women, and children were scalped. I saw one woman whose privates had been mutilated. Sergeant Lucian Palmer, 1st Cavalry Company C. The bodies were horribly cut up. Skulls broken in, in good many. I judge they were broken in after they were killed, as they were not shot besides. I do not think I saw any but what was scalped, saw fingers cut off, several bodies with privates cut off, women and men as well. And so when you get down to the human level, we're not talking about huge statistics at this point. We're talking about people who were fathers, husbands, uh, you know, leaders in their community. How do you go from that to mutilating people's genitals and removing parts of bodies has trophies. How do you rectify that? Well, I think that actually the indigenous perspective can actually clear some of this uh, mystery up. It can, can clear up some of the experience of, you know, that all these statistics uh, the, 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 the narration of all of these genocides might become so overwhelming. And, and uh, b- before I address that in depth, though, I, I want to raise uh, briefly, go over a few more points of what uh, uh, Micah had uh, originally asked me about what are some of the ongoing effects right, of, of this genocide. Now, I apologize for delaying that, but th- that's that's probably one of the most important questions uh, that can be raised on this topic. Uh, So I just want to delay it just a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, um, I want to give you just a few examples of not only the ongoing pain that indigenous peoples experience in in America, we could say in the Americas, Um, but but which which also... uh, relate to the element of ignorance, general ignorance, right, about the genocide. Uh, For instance, I'll just make a few things here. I don't know if you're aware of Lake Havasu. Lake Havasu is an artificial reservoir in Arizona. It's very popular in the summertime, right? People go there, women go in bikinis, men go uh, to have fun in their boats. You know, they're having fun in the hot weather, right? Uh, swimming. Um, the, the fact is that Lake Havasu is an intentionally flooded uh, Chemehuevi burial ground. Chemehuevi is, is uh, uh, one of the local tribes there. So their sacred burial ground right, was flooded in order uh, to create this artificial lake, Lake Havasu. So you, you can go on YouTube, you can go online, look up Lake Havasu, see uh, videos of, of people in their swimwear and bikinis, right? Um, you know, having their merry fun uh, in their boats, right? S- sailing Lake Havasu. Uh, there's complete ignorance there, I think, of of the desecration that that uh, is predicated upon, right? It's just complete ignorance about that. But you can imagine how the Chimawavi feel, right? Yeah. Or in California, Right at Tehachapi Park. Right? This is more or less Southern California, but uh, on the way to Central California. This is the area uh, of several tribes, including the Kowaisu uh, tribe. Right? Uh, there was a uh, the a Tahon. It's called Tahon Ranch. Right? It's this particular area uh, it, it, at at Tehachapi, and the the Kowaisu, uh tribe leader. Some years ago, David Laughing Horse Robinson brought a lawsuit right, uh, against the government, which was uh, dismissed. What was this lawsuit about? Well, the, the, uh, the California population, members of the California population, worked over 40,000 Kwaisu tribe members to death on a reservation in the 1800s and the early part of the 1900s. So there are 40,000 of these victims buried there. And what California wanted to do, uh, and, and right, is of course develop that area, put in luxury homes, a golf course, a mall, and this uh, was approved right back in the days of when Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor in California. So again, 
uh, in general, I think there's complete ignorance of the desecration involved in that. Uh, but again, you have to ask, how do you, how do you think that, you know, the, the class who try, how uh, each member feels uh, about luxury homes, malls, golf courses being put over the, the bones of 40,000 of their people who were murdered, right, worked to death. Uh, the last example I'll point out here, it's, uh, you, you can find uh, on YouTube a 1985 Earthworks documentary. It's called Broken Rainbow, right? And it's narrated by Martin Sheen and partly by Burgess Meredith. And uh, this would be a good point to run that second soundbite. Yeah, we'll play that now. I really wish that Navajo leaders and Navajo people generally would take a look at this and say we don't like it. Uh, it's rotten, it, uh, it's unfair, we wish they had done it some other way. But we're Americans like everyone else, and we can uh, change if we have to, and we'll find some more land that our kids will think is just as good as this land, and get on with it. Get on with it, he said. Right, that's a Democrat politician, right, uh, back, back in 1985. What, what was he commenting on? He was commenting on a law that uh, had been passed, which forcefully relocated 10,000 Navajo, basically threw them off their land. Why? <laughs> because oil, coal, uranium, and natural gas had been discovered on their land. Now, uh, the, the, the main player here is Peabody Energy. It's the world's largest coal company. Uh, so the, this forced relocation, which uh, a lot of people died because of it, because of the, the, the stress of it, the strain, and the psychological effects. But also they died from, for instance, uh, the, the, uh, on the Navajo uh, uh, land, right, the, the, there's twice the national average right, for uh, birth defects, birth deformities, because of uranium uh, trailing. So it's radiation poisoning. Right? And all of this was known. And the Department of the Interior uh, just waived something like well over a dozen environmental laws in order to increase the energy extraction, which is causing uh, this untold. It, it's just um, uh, it's 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 just heartbreaking. And the the reason it is pertinent is because this is we're talking about this is a 1974 uh, congressional law that was passed. Right. And th this is ongoing. These, these types of relocations are ongoing. Right. When the government discovers oil, coal, uranium or natural gas right, on Native American land or on some reservation, well, you're off some to somewhere else. Right. And uh, you have to understand that this, this type of relocation is also a tool of genocide. Now, I'm not saying that there's a, a, you know, a fully developed genocide that's still underway. What I mean is this. Indigenous peoples have a particular connection to the land, right? to, the, to their native land. Right. When, when, you re, when you take them away from their land, you basically murder them psychologically, spiritually, emotionally. And then, of course, on top of that, of course, you're going to have uh, physical problems alcoholism, uh, drug addiction problems, right? Um, but, uh, and here we're getting close to, to going back to Jason's, uh, get, getting back to Jason's question, because we're really, I think, going to get to, at least in my opinion, to the nitty gritty and to the, to, to the root of it all, and to, to, to how do we really explain all of this uh, and why genocides are, are so horrific. But, but by the way, you know, that first soundbite that I supplied you is, is was was from a Republican on Fox News. Mm -hmm. uh, the second soundbite was from a, d a Democrat. Right. Right. Uh, so, you know, th th this is a nonpartisan issue, and also this Peabody Energy, which was responsible for for throwing off these ten thousand Navajos from their land. Right. If you look, if you do some investigation into that uh, nineteen seventy four congressional law that was passed. Right? and thereafter, the, the series of laws that were passed, right? you will find the following people behind that, promoting that. And it's John McCain, John Kerry, John Rockefeller, Teddy Kennedy, Bill Clinton, and Al Gore. Ah. 
right? These were all people, of course, because Peabody Energy was a Massachusetts uh, entity. It's the world's largest coal company. And well, it's, I mean, part of being a politician, right, is, is having a constituents and also trying to become wealthy yourself based on your contacts and, 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 and your own business ventures that open up to you because of this, this privileged position, uh, uh, right, as a politician. So uh, this is really an untold story. There's complete ignorance about it. Um, that, uh, and, and of course, you know, th those I listed there, there, there are, of course, se several Democrats, but, but also John McCain right, was a Republican. So again, uh, these types of so-called land grabs, right, the government grabbing land because uh, Native American land because uh, of energy resources being found there, it's something that that uh, it still happens today. This is not 200 years ago. This is not 100 years ago. This is today. Yeah. It's, it's, it's still today. But, you know, if you're not into uh, <laughs> Native American issues uh, and Nat Native American developments, you're going to be completely oblivious to it. You know, so there is this, this spiritual connection, right? The land that a particular tribe lives on, right? That land is the basis, for instance, of their religion. Often they will have sacred stories, for instance, perhaps about some nearby mountain, right? Or some nearby boulder or some nearby river. And this has to do perhaps with their creation story. You take them away from the land, now the, the, their spirituality has been destroyed. If you look, for instance, at the Pine Ridge Reservation, you know, Pine Ridge, North Dakota, the life expectancy there is worse than most third world countries. Mm -hmm. And there, there's horrendous problems with, with alcoholism uh, and drug addiction. Right? Uh, why? Because their ancestors were killed 100 years ago? It's, you know, it's, it, yes, but also because uh, of the lingering psychological effects mm -hmm. and of all of these burdens right, uh, that, that are imposed upon indigenous peoples today by the things you see in the popular news that, that we've already heard. Right, uh, earlier in this conversation, uh, these laws that are passed that throw uh, indigenous peoples off their land when natural resources are found, and they're told by what? A Democrat? Uh, a Morris Udall? Well, get over it. Move on. You can find land that your children will find just as good as this land. That's not so. As I said, often their religion is anchored in uh, the various landmarks. You can't get over it. To me, it's not only ridiculous, but it's offensive to presume that we should tell a group of people, uh, get over the fact that we're taking your home from you. I mean, you would never see this done in midtown Manhattan if oil reserves were found under New York. The ongoing land grab aspect of this, when we go back to Sand Creek, which we've kind of focused on in not only this discussion, but also we spent a good amount of time talking about with Daniele Bellelli, the, the idea of the Sand Creek Massacre again, in part had to do with the fact that people were being removed from their land and relocated due to the discovery of gold in the Rockies. And so, again, we look at that as one of the greatest massacres of, of Native American people in American history, but the causal agent behind that remains consistent in terms of the removal and the relocation of people. And, you, you, again, you talk about in South Dakota – uh, at Pine Ridge, this has been something I've been look, you know, looking at for years, the rampant alcoholism, you know, the mm -hmm. teenage suicide rate. I mean, we're talking not about people who are you know, even taking into consideration, like you mentioned, the life expectancy mm -hmm. there on the reservation, but we're not even talking about the tribal elders. We're talking about teenagers who are so depressed yes. with their living conditions that they see no recourse, they see no other way but to, to end their own lives. So these ongoing issues and talking about, the again, from the Native American perspective, their cosmological connection with the land, this is so far removed, I think, from the sort of secularized American way of seeing things and the resource-based perspective on things. Uh, That's right. I mean, it, it's horrible. If you horrible. look at the, the older so-called ethnographic literature, right, Western scholars uh, who wrote all of these, you know, folklore of this tribe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Right, you'll see the same types of attitudes. That is, they belittle the tribal beliefs, the sacred beliefs, right? The sacred stories. Oh, you know, those are superstitious uh, savages uh, to to believe such a thing. Oh, they think that a coyote created the earth, you know, or whatever. 
right? And so it's that uh, yeah, it, it, there, there's a hubris, there's an arrogance, and it's it's part of the mentality that uh, makes possible the machinery of death. You know, to, b- to borrow a, a phrase from Holocaust studies, the overall machinery of death. You have to have certain tropes in place, certain attitudes in place, and one is that uh, well, these well, these obviously these are idiotic, uh, stupid savages, right? They have all these silly uh, uh, ch- childish uh, religious beliefs and uh, whatever. You know, they, they don't wear clothes, some of them, or w- w- whatever. Right to diminish those beliefs. Uh, in modern times, to me, is comparable to the exact same attitudes which allowed and facilitated the genocide when Europeans first arrived in North America. And again, well, it's, that's right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, you know, that's that's essentially the idea. I mean, to me, what we have to understand, I think, and the big takeaway maybe from this conversation is that we can understand the history. But the ideological perspectives have continued, and although there may not be actual killing, there may not be actual murder like what we saw historically, the same subjugation and the same ideological constraints that we put on people whose ideas differ from our own are leading to further atrocities even today. They may not be carried out in the same way or in the same atrocious manner, but the problems cons- uh, you know, consistently have persisted over the, the decades, and we are still dealing with them today. That's right. Well, the, for instance, the, the, the problems you, you mentioned at Pine Ridge Reservation, I think basically, right, the, the basic problem, uh, the, ca- the, the causal agent there, is that they, they are aware of their traditional culture, and they see that it is not, that those that are in power, the system that is in charge, will not allow them to recover and practice their traditional way of life. And that is the root cause uh, of the depression, right, that leads to the, the alcoholism and the drug addiction. The hopelessness and despair is all about not being able to live their traditional way of life. It is made impossible uh, by the, the system that is in place. Um, and having said that, now we can get back to Jason's question uh, <laughs> and my own particular take on it and my own particular explanation. And uh, take it for for uh, what it's worth in your view. Uh, let's make a few definitional uh, clarifications. People use definitions, right, with, with in different ways, with different senses. So, so we have to be very clear. So I'll be very clear in how I uh, am using these particular words, right? When I say indigenous, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, 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 groups of people that are, are so diverse, it's impossible to generalize about them. But for the sake of conversation, the quote-unquote ideal type would be the hunter-gatherer. And some of the tribes are on different areas, right, on that continuum. S- some are more mobile than others, in other words. And, it's, uh, and then compare that to what I will call civilization. And now what I mean by civilization, uh, I'm, I'm being very literal, right? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm using the term in its etymological sense, right, which goes back to Latin, which is the city, right? So... The, what I want to talk about here uh, to explain, you know, why this phenomenon of genocide, why is it so overwhelming when we hear so much uh, about it and so many narrations of it? About 10,000 years ago or so, hunter-gatherers in the southern Anatolia region began to transition right, gradually to, uh, a li- to, a civil- to a city-based way of life, a more mobile way of life, right? There was a transition period before uh, the real city-based life right, was established. Right. Right? So you have your mobile hunter-gatherers, and then a transition stage, and then you have civilization, right, in, in the sense of city-based life, right? right? An immobile way of life, which David Quinn has said, what's the essence of civilization, right? In other words, of city-based life, 
and that is agriculture. And he terms it totalitarian agriculture. Because think of it, you've settled down, a group settles down in a village, and then it becomes a city, right? And why did that transition take place? Because about 10,000 years ago, right, uh, the, the wheat plant in southern Anatolia uh, underwent a spontaneous genetic mutation that for the first time allowed it to be manipulated and controlled, right? And so then agriculture starts. All right, once you get agriculture, you, uh, even though we, bread had been made before that time, right? Still, the system of agriculture uh, right, follows after the whole control and manipulation of the wheat plant in that area, right, southern Anatolia. Once you get all of this uh, bread that you can create, you have surplus. You start to have surplus. Once you have surplus, your population begins to increase, right, uh, significantly, dramatically, right? And so you have more people to feed. Well, that means you have to have more land to plant more wheat and other crops on. Where do you get that? Well, you got to take it away from, uh, you know, this other city or from these tribes out there who haven't uh, decided to live in a city, uh, you know, according to a city way of life, right? And so it, there, there's a very good article by Jared Diamond that was, well, let's see if my memory is right, it was published in the, in the Discover magazine mm -hmm. back in 1987. Uh, Jared Diamond is an anthropologist. He, he wrote a very good article called The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race. Talking about um, agriculture. <laughs> that's right. Yep. The, uh, civilization, which is based on agriculture, right, immediately, and this is not to idealize the indigenous and to demonize uh, the city-based way of life or civilization. Sure. But I think from an indigenous perspective, you would have to say that you're dealing with the difference between the proverbial heaven and hell. Mm. Uh, because once you make that transition to civilization, that is city-based way of life, you start to have right, uh, new phenomena that were completely unknown before. Of course, the seeds might have been there, but you have new explicit, on an explicit, uh, on explicit levels, and you have new phenomena. That is, now you have governments, you have kings and queens, in control of armies, you have a very organized uh, religion, right? And uh, you have the social classes, right? The, 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 the few who are in control, uh, the masses, right, who uh, are anywhere from what today we would call middle income to those who have basically nothing, right? So you have the social stratification uh, as far as uh, economic structures are concerned. Then you develop in this whole scenario uh, something that ha had really not existed, and that is what we could call total warfare. Uh, you know, indigenous groups, uh, often their wars, right, were more like games, right, where, where you had something decided by a game. Uh, maybe a small number of people uh, lost their lives, but this whole concept of total warfare or genocide really despite the fact that, you know, you can, you, you, uh, indigenous people can be as brutal as anyone else. The fact is, if, if you look at the history of civilization, the history of city-based life, right, compared to uh, indigenous uh, ways of life, I think, I would, su I, I would suggest that there is where you're going to find uh, uh, a clue. Right as to well, you know, why is it so overwhelming to us when we hear about all these genocides? How can such quote unquote barbarity take place? Right? How, how can it be so gruesome? The indigenous person looking at civilizations, I think, has a pretty good grasp on that. Whereas people who know only a civilized mentality that is a city-based way of life with with the heavy economic competition and all of that, are going to get pretty overwhelmed by considering all, all of this evil, right? Uh, because they, they don't, I think they don't have the intellectual uh, uh, or the knowledge, right, the key of knowledge, right, that, that helps you understand the difference between the indigenous way of life and the city-based way of life. 
when we look at the indigenous perspective, uh, and again, I think it's important that when we use that term here, we don't necessarily just mean Native Americans in that context. Indigenous right, people. Indigenous, right. Indigenous people in any culture, anywhere around the world at any point in time, who have come essentially from a, or, or along the progressive stages, we might say, of subsisting off of the land, will see life differently from people who are oriented on a economic structure rooted in agriculture. And of course, you know, the not just harvesting from, from the land in terms of, of produce, but also of horticulture. And in terms of orienting oneself around a city-state structure and the comparison and the divide that exists between that way of life and the conceptual thought that goes with it and the people who exist. Again, I don't think it's fair to say more simply. I think we should just simply see that as a different way of life, that being the ideal of the indigenous way of life. When people from those differing methods of living and subsisting clash, they cannot understand ideologically uh, where they are, again, coming from. I mean, the idea of Europeans coming and indigenous people in North America at the time of colonial contact, the idea of them understanding the ideology, the worldview, the structure of cities, it was a very difficult thing, and it was probably, in truth, almost impossible. And so, I mean, it kind of goes both ways, but the problem inevitably that results is there's a divide, there's a breakdown in communication. There is, of course, the dehumanization because of the perception of someone who is less than based on their way of life. And the end result, of course, I think we can say historically, often leads to tragedy. Well, here's something to, to ponder. Uh, and, and, and also, I think a key to understanding this whole issue is this. Uh, as I mentioned about the Pine Ridge situation, these, the, the, much of the depression there and so hopelessness and despair and disease uh, is caused by right, the, the despair over the present system, not making it impossible right, to live their traditional way of life. Right? Now, what, uh, what do I mean by that? If you look at the history of civilizations, and again, I'm using it in a very restricted sense, city-based uh, cultures, making contact with indigenous peoples, you will see over and over and over and over the pattern that if those indigenous people do not give up their way of life and join in the civilization or the city-based way of life, they must be exterminated. There is no tolerance possible. You can, uh, sure, you don't have to uh, physically kill all of them. You, you can round them up, put them on reservations, take away, take away their land so that they become psychologically, spiritually uh, devastated, right? And so in that way you deal with it. But you, you cannot, as no civilization, is a because of the economic structures it's predicated upon is able to allow an indigenous group to survive as such they must make the transition to the city-based way of life they must start contributing to the to to the economic structure or they must be exterminated right either physically or some other way you uh, and, and why is that because i think psychologically when city-based uh, cultures, the people in them, look at indigenous cultures, there's something in them, deep down inside, they realize we all came from that. Our, you know, in remote uh, time, we were all that way. That's where we all come from. From the indigenous perspective, when that way of life, right, the indigenous way of life is abandoned, that is a primordial act uh, of betrayal and of life in general. And so you cannot allow people in uh, your city to see that, oh, look, there is an alternate way of life, right, where you don't have to work eight hours a day, uh, 10 hours a day. You can work two to four hours a day and meet all your daily needs. And uh, you, you don't have to have a $1,500 uh, rent and you, you don't have to, you, you know, there is a better way of life, right? That's the, pers that's the indigenous perspective. These city-based uh, cultures, the people in them, right, they cannot be allowed to see that there is an alternative way. Because even if one person leaves that system and, quote-unquote, those native, over the period of their lifetime, 
right? That culture, that's that city-based culture, is going to lose anywhere what hundred thousand to a million dollars, uh, right? In, in income and a house that would have been bought, and so you keep multiplying that. And I think you can make a good case that economics, right, plays a large role in, uh, in this. It's not to boil it down to that uh, and to make that a, a you know some kind of global causation, right? That's it. And it's only economics, right? Which I guess would be a Marxist way of looking at it. Sure. There are uh, other things well, in the mix, right? The economic side of it, it really does play in a large part here because take, for instance, the arrival of Hernando Cortez moving into central Mexico and finding massive cities that rivaled those of Europe that were designed environmentally sound. They were beautiful. They had flowing water. They had markets full of goods. And there was a, a city life there that was was massive and and had indigenous people living there in that type of environment however even though the conquistadors and the spanish they marveled in their journals about how beautiful the people were and how clean the people were and how beautiful the cities were and how well they were organized there was still something that pushed them to the point of well that's okay and we can appreciate this and we can admire that hey they actually are you know, on par with us as far as technology and advancements, at least in the ways of structuring cities. But we want the gold. So therefore, we're willing to murder and rape and pillage and destroy. Same thing with Sand Creek. Later on in the 1800s, we see people moving west for the gold rush. We see people doing land grabs. And again, these indigenous people are in our way. So in the name of progress, in the name of economics, and in the name of lining our own pockets, it's okay to murder people. And then getting back to what I talked about earlier, what I get, you know, I guess you could say I understand. I I can't condone it. and I I can't really wrap my mind around how someone can do that to someone else just out of greed. But when it gets down to the human level, when it's the one on one and we're talking about things like, okay, we're not just getting these people out of the way. We're not just murdering them. The part I can't ever seem to wrap my mind around is how do you go from let's just move these people out of the way to. Let me mutilate them. Let me desecrate their bodies. Let me, uh, you know, torture and kill and remove their genitals. And I mean, how do you get to that point of just animalistic behavior? That level is the one that I can never seem to wrap my mind around because it's like I've said before, these people were fathers. These people had children. These people had wives and they would never behave that way to their own family or their own kindred. So why is it okay to do that? Where does the conscience go? Where does the respect for another human, a crying baby, uh, a screaming woman, where does that disappear when you get down to that very finite human level? Well, I I don't have an answer, a complete answer, but a part of what's going on there, I think, again, is is what I referred to, is that I think that, quote unquote, civilizations in in city-based cultures there is something deep in the psychology right, that realizes uh, that, that, you know, in, in deep time, we're all, we were all indigenous, right? And right, we were more, uh, you know, more in harmony with uh, the, the other animals, Right, because you know we humans are animals too. So with, with the other animals, all the other animals, we were more in harmony with them. Think of the Gilgamesh epic, right? Inkadu is living with the animals, uh, and he has to be taken away. He has to be quote unquote civilized, right? And so he has to be introduced to beer and bread, right? Agriculture, right? And of course, they use a prostitute to do it. It's a very uh, entertaining story, but uh, <laughs> it's it's a story about. Uh, someone living, right, uh, in harmony, right, with the world in general, and then being taken uh, into the confines of city walls. The city walls cut off all the other animals you used to know, uh, and therefore, uh, since everything is interrelated, when we live in city within city walls, we are alienated from a part of ourselves, right. And so deep inside of us, I think we uh, people fear, right, that, oh, well, the, these indigenous people remind us 
of, uh, of a way of life where you're more in harmony with the animals, for instance, we can't give in to that. You know, we can't be friends with the wolves. We've got to kill the wolves because they'll kill us. Uh, you know, I, it, 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 there's, there's so much that can be said on this. Uh, but I think that there's, there's something deep in our psychology that is afraid, right, of indigenous people. And I'm not saying, right, that, uh, you know, indigenous people are like Inkadu. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in the psychology uh, of, of city-based culture, right, there is a deep-seated fear that links indigenous peoples with forces of nature that frighten them, make them afraid that they can lose control. And it's, it's, uh, it's life uh, against life. It's, it's a life or death situation. You cannot, t like I said, civilizations cannot tolerate indigenous groups as indigenous groups. They must be exterminated in some modality. Why is that? And why does it manifest itself in such barbar uh, quote unquote barbarity? Right? I think it's because it, there is something in the psychology that, that activates these very deep-seated fears about loss of control, right? that uh, some, the, the idea of control that has been instilled in civilizations for thousands of years now, 10,000 years more or less. So there's 10,000 uh, years more or less uh, of an ideological programming right, for, for living in cities, divorced from uh, whatever is there in the world outside the city walls. And what is outside the city walls is the opposite of civilization. And it, it's, it's death. It must be controlled. It's like that Genesis idea that, you know, you have to dominate uh, the, the land, dominate the world, control it. Right? Um, why? Because you, there's a sense of fear of loss of control that is 10,000 years in the making within a civil, civilized consciousness. And the encounter with indigenous cultures activates, I think, these deep-seated fears that, right, if I let them live, that means I'm saying it's their way of life is legitimate and these 10,000 years of this uh, city life, you know, all the barbarity, uh, all the sweat, the, the work from sun up to sundown that these indigenous people don't have to go through and uh, don't have to live by, you know, the, you know what's the point of it all? Uh, but anyway, so I think that there's a deep-seated fear of uh, a loss of control. And, uh, 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 and what I mean by that is it's a life and death it's a fear about the, the encounter between life and death, right? So they're experiencing civilization versus the indigenous as life versus death. And the indigenous people experience the same fear. There's a very famous anthropological film uh, that, that I saw once, uh, 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 indigenous tribe somewhere, I think it was in Brazil, right? Uh, there was a plane flying over. They caught sight of this uh, members of this tribe and when one uh, when the members of the tribe saw this airplane and saw the 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 anthropologists actually you could see the fear incarnate in their eyes and they turned around screaming and ran back into the jungle why because by instinct i think they knew that if they encounter these people they are dead it is the end of their culture it it is inevitable. Right. I challenge anyone, show me a civilization that has ever encountered an indigenous group that did not exterminate it in some modality. They cannot tolerate it. Why? I think there are psycho deep-seated psychological factors that uh, part of it uh, have to do with uh, biological evolution, but also with our own history and the transition from indigenous ways of life into city-based ways of life, uh, which, of course, has you know, been... Uh, reinforced for about 10,000 years. Absolutely. So, 
tying, anyway, tying, yeah, I, don't, I don't claim to have an answer, but those are some of my musings. <laughs> sure. Tying it all together. You know, again, if there was one big takeaway, which is I, we've already said so much, but if you wanted to really kind of drive home a point to those who are interested in this subject and who would like to, you know, perhaps do some further self-education on the subject, how, how could you convey to people uh, what the best way to go about doing that would be? Wow, uh, that, that's difficult. See, um, because f- for me... Uh, it's only taken you a few decades, Samuel, right? <laughs> well, no, what I, well, my whole life, because I, I was profoundly influenced by my grandmother, right? And she, for instance, she would, would say things like, well, how would you feel? She would, I remember she would talk to visitors, for instance, right, to the home. She would say, well, how would you feel if they took away your land, right? Hmm. So... You know, I, I had some exposure to the indigenous mentality, right, from childhood on. And well, so, you know, I, I don't know what one does. Uh, certainly, uh, I, you know, the last thing that indigenous people want to see are, are white people uh, pretending to be indigenous or, or adopting indigenous ways or indigenous religions. Or, is there, that's very offensive as well, the appropriation of indigenous culture. And, you know, you can find that all over YouTube, you know, the so-called plastic shamans, these uh, white people, quote unquote, right, uh, acting like Indians, dressing up like uh, Native Americans, and it's very offensive to indigenous people. Uh, So what does one do? I I guess, you know, one would just have to explore, try to read books by indigenous uh, scholars and indigenous peoples read uh, some of the older uh, 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 literature as well, written by Native Americans at the time right, right. of contact and uh, the time thereafter, you know, into the eight, we have literature in English, right, going back to the 1700s, and then, it, of course, even more in the 1800s. Uh, and then you have people like Charles Eastman, who's somewhat controversial. Uh, indigenous peoples have divided uh, opinions about him. Uh, but in any case, he, uh, his book, though, is is uh, also something worth pursuing. I, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Soul of the Indian, I believe, uh, was his famous book, if I'm not mistaken, which I may be. Anyway, try to find literature by Native peoples. You could get on YouTube uh, also. There are some good names to look up. I, I think Russell Means. For instance, he's now passed on a few years ago from cancer, but he was instrumental in founding the American uh, yeah, Eric, American Indian movement, and it's still being ran by his wife, or at least to some degree, Pearl Means. Uh, but, you know, the, many natives, uh, many, many indigenous peoples around the world, uh, as far as that goes, you know, ha, ha, uh, have written on a plethora of topics, including uh, you know, what we're talking about today. Um, I think really education and acknowledgement is something that everybody needs to consider when you say, okay, we've received this information now, we're hearing this on the podcast, what do we do about it from here? And I think, first of all, uh, use some of these these criteria that we've talked about here today, use some of these sources and look this stuff up for yourself, educate yourself about it, and then we get into the acknowledgement of it. I think one of the biggest tragedies when dealing with this situation the American Holocaust or the genocide of Native Americans is something equally as offensive as what happened in the first place is the fact that nobody knows about it. So the acknowledgement of it is as important, in my opinion, as the education. So educate educate yourself about it and then find ways to become involved with some of these organizations. There's a lot of them that are out there, that are environmentally based, that are culturally based, and find a way to get involved because everybody can be a part of the solution as we move forward. But we have to first acknowledge there is a problem and we have to be educated on it overall. Yes, and and people can start with Standard's book that we've been discussing. And uh, the other book I was going to mention is called How It Is, The Native American Philosophy of V. F. Cordova. Uh, As I said, the Arizona University Press. Uh, of course, not all indigenous people will agree with the take in that particular book, but that is that is um, a book written by an indigenous scholar, Viola Fay, I think her middle name was uh, Cordova, who, who's passed on. You know, so it's it's an indigenous person explaining indigenous philosophy, an indigenous view of life, right, and how it, it contrasts with 
civilizational city-based cultures. So read Standard's book and then try to find books by indigenous peoples themselves. Hauska, the Kuchiching First Nation, is a tribal attorney based in Washington, D.C. She is the National Campaign's Director of Honor the Earth and a former advisor on Native American affairs to Bernie Sanders. She advocates on behalf of tribal nations at the local and federal levels on a range of issues impacting indigenous peoples and recently spent six months living and working in North Dakota fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline. She is a co-founder of Not Your Mascots, a nonprofit committed to educating the public about the harms of stereotyping and promoting positive representation of Native Americans in the public sphere. First of all, thank you for joining us here on this podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, We know you're very busy. And in 2017, you gave a TED Talk that is fantastic. We'll have that linked in the show notes. We hope everyone will go and watch that. And in that, I just want to lead off with something that you said that particularly struck home with me, and I know that all of us here probably feel that way. And that was when you said, if I may quote you, it's very, very difficult to be in these shoes, to stand here as a product of genocide survival, of genocide. Uh, So first, thank you for your courage and your commitment to this cause. But I mean, it's a daily fight, really, living in the context of the words that you gave during that talk, right? It is. I mean, it's a constant daily assault of folks not really understanding or knowing who Indigenous people are and the struggle that Indigenous people have gone through and what it means to exist today um, in this society that's crea- been created around us. Um, it is a ongoing struggle of education and trying to open people's eyes to you know both historical context and lessons, but also where we're at now and moving forward. Yeah. As we get here, uh, you're our third guest dealing with this subject, and it has been a ride. It has been an experience, and it has been, honestly, it's been soul-sucking in a lot of ways. It has put out so much um, information, and it's put out so much a weight for what happened to the indigenous peoples of North, Central, and South America. And I would like to talk about the lasting effects of that genocide on modern native cultures. Uh, where does that still place you today? And, and how do you feel about uh, sort of that term that so many people put on the native cultures of being a product of the genocide? Yeah. And I think it's important to, you know, acknowledge the fact that I think so many of us face kind of this attitude of that was a really long time ago. You guys should get over it. You know, it's 2018. Why are you not over this? You know, everyone else has moved on from the, historical traumas and, you know, wrongs of the past, the sins of the fathers and the mothers. Um, You know, I think with indigenous peoples that one ignores the fact that these things are are not so far away. These are not so distant. Um, You know, my grandmother and her brothers and sisters went to residential schools, uh, to boarding schools, actually. They were sent across the border over here in in, um, South Dakota, you know, as First Nations children and are dealing with the effects today of, you know, these are living people that were sent to a school to be assimilated, forcefully assimilated and have their language and culture taken from them. Um, You know, that is a generational trauma. That is a living trauma. It is the people actually in your, you know, in your vicinity, in your family going through that. Um, But then there's also, you know, there's so many other forms of structural racism and violence that are incorporated in the very foundations of the United States, of Canada, of Mexico, um, you know, that it is systems and governments that are based upon slavery and genocide, you know, the theft of land, the theft of labor, um, you know, and to try to say, you know, well, you all should just, you know, it's, it's all clean slate, it's all been wiped clean, and we're all starting from the same place. No, we're not. Um, whether it's Native folks or any other folks of, you know, oppressed um, races, you know, or demographics. It's it's a whole system of simultaneously taking away the resources 
and um, you know the the opportunity from a people, while also casting down that that people that people's identity and culture um, and self value, you know, and stripping away so many opportunities that people don't even think about. You know, they okay, someone commits a crime, they're going to get punished for it. That's that's not how it works in Indian country. You know, you can commit a crime in Indian country, and if you happen to be a non-native person that committed that crime, there's a whole question about whether or not we can even, you know, prosecute you. Um, that's right. the reality of Native people living in the United States and in other places. And, you know, Tara, something I find striking is um, so often today we're seeing in the media and the news, and it's, it's, you know, equal rights for everyone and, you know, attention given to all of these different uh, groups and different people all across the world but yet it seems to be eerily quiet when it comes to the the rights and the, the protest and the situation surrounding indigenous cultures. Why do you think that is? One, I think, unfortunately, the genocidal policies of, you know, colonization were very, very successful. Um, you know, we are less than 2% of the population um of the united states you know um a small a small portion of the percentage of the population of canada of what's now today canada i mean there's a you know a a want and desire to suppress and and forget indigenous heritage when you come to south of the border south of the colonial border down in mexico um you know people are taught from a very young age that there was this period of sadness that happened and there were people that existed but then it moves right into this very nationalist ideal of you know then america happened and there was manifest destiny and there was the the homesteaders and this you know this this expansion this westward expansion um and it's painted in a very patriotic you know uplifting way and so i think people are left with this idea of native folks are people from the past you know they are cultures that that existed but but were stamped out um, and there's not anything after that, right? You look in the history books at how much, how much information are our children taught about Native people living today? I mean, you go into places where, I mean, in the state of Minnesota, there's 11 tribes. I, I could go and ask, I mean, growing up when I was in my hometown, we didn't, even, we didn't learn about any Native folks beyond the Iroquois and Sitting Bull. And those were our two Native, you know, that was, it was like one page in our history books. And no one had any idea who the people were surrounding us. And looking at me in, in class, like, you know, what are you doing here? How are you here? Um, you know, that's a very common experience, I think, and one that is reinforced by these romanticized ideals of these pa- these past people that were brave warriors that, that died out. Yeah. You know, you mentioned history books, and I've heard you say in the past that around 87% of references in textbooks to Native Americans are pre-1900s. How along with, I mean arguably the powerful advocacy and awareness that you enact in your daily lifestyle. I mean, how can we move this narrative into the 21st century? Tell us some ways that we can all work together to do more of that. I think that, you know, it's, it comes from all of us, you know, it shouldn't just come from indigenous people. It should come from all people wanting to write the mistakes of the past and also to learn from them. Right. Right. I think as, especially as we're seeing the rise of fascism and we're seeing the rise of extremism, um of nazis back in the streets killing people um you know we should be looking very very carefully at our history and making sure that we are learning from the mistakes of the past um which includes the oppression of indigenous people which includes rounding up and othering native people and putting them on reservations i mean that is how the genocidal policies of hitler that's that was one of his inspirations he was very inspired by the united states treatment of native people and how effective it was at you know systematically um, undercutting an entire demographic of people that were actually from the territory. Um, you know, I think it comes from all of us demanding that our children are being taught an education that's actually correct. It means that when Thanksgiving rolls around that we are not allowing our kids to be dressed up in paper headdresses and pilgrims and being fed this happy story of Thanksgiving. It means that we are upset that our kids are not learning about tribal tribal people that are existing today and, and not learning the, the history of brown and black folks in these in this continent um you know i mean you look at a place like oregon where they've made the teaching of oregon and washington actually are both moving towards making it mandatory to um include native curriculum in all curriculum all school 
cur- curriculum and that's not just pre-1900s it's it's modern it's today it's what are the treaty rights of the people that are living here today um that is a major shift towards change and i think it's something that we can all do by attending our school board meetings by attending um you know our, our teacher conferences and asking them you know what are you teaching my children and that shouldn't just come from native people that should come from everyone you're absolutely right we can all be more involved tara if i may i'll just very briefly tell you i was in regina saskatchewan earlier this year and as i was walking to a music con- uh, concert that i was going to i bought the newspaper on my way down and the front page said campers must leave and this was in reference to the justice for our stolen children camp there outside of the legislature in Reg- regina saskatchewan and i didn't go to the to the event I was going to, I went straight to the courthouse and I went and I spoke to the people who were there camping. And it was a moving, it was a powerful and important, I mean, truly a formative experience for me. And one thing I would add to what you're saying is in addition to being politically and culturally aware, maybe go and talk to people, ask them, how can I learn more about this, right? I mean, I think everyone, like you said, and this is the most important thing too, everyone can help make this change, but everyone must be involved for that to occur. Absolutely. And the tendency and the want of people to, you know, to be defensive and to say, you know, I'm not this way. Um, you know, my, my mascot isn't racist. When I wear this, this Halloween costume of another race, I'm not being racist. It's just for fun. Um, you know, when my children are learning these things, it's not, they're not doing this intentionally. So it's not me. I'm defensive. And so that leads to things like, you know, people taking statistics and saying, well, all Native people are poor. They live on reservations. They're all, you know, alcoholics. They're all drug users, you know, in this othering that happens, right? And then you lose empathy and you lose, you know, the sense of personhood for, the, for, the, for those people um, rather than being like, you know, we are all in this struggle together and we can learn a lot from one another. And it shouldn't be viewed as an attack to say, this land belongs to somebody else. It shouldn't be viewed as an attack to say that this is the original homelands of, of people who are still here today. That is not an attack on a people. That is an acknowledgement of a reality. And, you know, it's, it's something that we should all learn from and not view it as, well, these natives they get all these special rights. You know, why, why did they get rights that I don't get? And, it, and it's, a, it's a complete lack of understanding of what treaties are and how the country was formed. Um, you know, and, and where we're at today, we should be very aware of our history. We should all be knowing that and we don't. And so I think this, this defense mechanism that comes out of people is largely one that's born out of ignorance and often not intentional. Right. Absolutely. Before I turn it over to one of my colleagues here with another question, I do just want to follow up with one thing that you mentioned there. You know, the stigmas and the stereotypes about, you know, people, you know, suffering from alcoholism and things like this. I I often have gone back and revisited the news reporting from the early part of this century about the suicide rate among teenage uh, members of the indigenous reservations in South Dakota and other places, too. Can we talk just for a moment about the stereotypes and the problem with the stereotypes in addition to the real problems with alcoholism, with suicide among young people and the reasons that actually cause that? Absolutely. You know, you look at something like, okay, so at Wapiskit First Nation, there was a, um, you know, state of emergency called because 11 people tried to commit suicide in a single night. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the, the suicide epidemics that happen across First Nations and Indian country and, you know, these spaces of people who are, you know, experiencing so much trauma, both intergenerationally and also just, you know, from living in a place where we are not at all acknowledged and invisibilized and have complete, you know, oftentimes very little access to um, opportunity, you know, and to education and to equality. Um, you know, those, those stereotypes and those stigmas feed into that. You know, you are looking at a, at a society. I mean, for me, when I went out to Washington, D.C., you know, I'm coming from a very small place. I, come from, I grew up in a border town um, and went out to a place where I was excited to be an attorney. I was going to work for tribal nations all over the country. And that first week there, I'm seeing all these people walking around wearing the Washington Redskins jersey mm. and having never met a Native person in their entire lives. You know, and then you go to a, a game or a, or a bar and you see all these people that are wearing, you know, headdresses and acting in these really stereotyped, awful ways, um, mimicking your race. And it's, it's horrifying. You know, it's, it's horrifying to think, you know, this is what you really think. And this is what society thinks. 
um, you know, where does that place me? You know, where does that place me as a child growing up and, and looking at that and, and feeling like this is my representation. People think I'm a stereotype. People think that I died like, like 200 years ago, um, that I still live in a teepee that I'm, you know, don't have access to running water or to, to the internet or am living in the century. I mean, that's, it's not a good feeling, especially when you acknowledge at the same time that, you know, you have all these social ills around you and you are living on territory that is yours and you are watching that people don't even know who you are on that territory. Right. You know, you know, this is a, a perfect time to introduce this, Tara. So while we're talking about the subject of mascots, uh, give us a description of your nonprofit that you're part of, not your mascot. So what exactly is it and what is the overall goal of not your mascots. Um, not your mascots is a group of native folks um, from across the United States. Who, I mean, essentially, we found each other on Twitter. Um, you know, we were. I had just moved out to DC and was becoming more involved in the, the mascot issue because we actually banned mascots in my home state of Minnesota back in 1992. So it's not something I was really familiar with. Um, and then I moved out there and saw that, and then I started, you know, getting involved online tweeting about it, you know, talking about it with others. And we kind of formed this loose collective and, you know, started working really hard to sharing the story out and, you know, letting people know that this is, this is what a real issue and this is what's happening. Um, and that led to, you know, a, a formation of an organization. Um, we started organizing protests and we started organizing rallies and, doing outreach in the community and hosting events and things like that and uh, creating educational materials for classrooms, for students, for all of these people across the country who were beyond just fighting the national teams, were actually fighting in their own school districts to change Indian mascots and to move on from that legacy. Yeah. Again, using the World Wide Web is arguably the very best way to engage people and to bring these issues to a, a broad audience. And of course, we're going to have all of the aforementioned linked right there at our website along with this episode. I want to bring up one more thing really quickly also to uh, Tara. And I'll quote from IndianLaw.org. In the United States, violence against indigenous women has reached unprecedented levels on tribal lands and in Alaska native villages. More than four in five American Indian and Alaska native women have experienced violence, and more than one in two have experienced sexual violence. Alaska native women continue to suffer the highest rate of forcible sexual assault and have reported rates of domestic violence up to ten times higher than in the rest of the United States. Though available data is limited, the number of missing and murdered American Indian and Alaska Native women and the lack of a diligent and adequate federal response is extremely alarming to indigenous women, tribal governments, and communities. On some reservations, indigenous women are murdered at more than ten times the national average. My question to you, Tara, how do we address this issue and bring awareness to it? Can training and awareness or can changing federal laws combat this problem? And if so, in your opinion, what is the best way to move forward? To me, one of the most, uh, I think that one of the most impactful ways to curb this issue is one, to start reporting on it. Um, but first and foremost, beyond any of it, is creating real fixes to the law and to the legal loopholes that exist and to the jurisdictional gaps that exist. Um, you know, there is an understanding that if you are raped and you are in Indian country, that um, there is a good chance that you're, you're, rapist or whoever may walk free um that your domestic abuser may walk free that your violent assault you know it may not be prosecuted and if it is you know there's a big chance that it might be kicked out of court because the federal prosecutor is actually not really that involved in that they, they didn't sign up to do that you know the the federal attorney signed up to prosecute massive drug cases and things like that there's that there's the jurisdictional fixes for that i think there's also you know significant education that needs to happen as far as you know law enforcement and following through on these cases i'm sure you guys saw that you know up in thunder bay um there's an entire inquiry happening of the racist ways and manners that you know the the thunder bay police officers pursued indigenous cases um any any cases that were involving indigenous people you know total lack of prosecution total lack of follow-through um that if you were a native person, like your, your case isn't just going to, is, is 
not even going to be half the time investigated. Um, that is is unacceptable, and that should be unacceptable to to everyone. Um, that we are such a significantly small portion of the population, yet we are a massive percent of the population when it comes to violent crimes um, and experiencing those crimes and being victims of those crimes. Um, you know, I think that the media can do a better job, but I, I certainly think the the biggest so- solutions come from um, the court systems fixing that will actually be Congress fixing the court systems. Um, I don't see it necessarily coming from the Supreme Court, especially given the current makeup. Um, but Congress making those fixes and also moving um, towards educating our police officers and our law enforcement on all sides of the colonial borders. Yeah, and this is part of what I was talking with folks like Delbert Crow, who I spoke with at the uh, Justice for Our Stolen Children camp there in Saskatchewan. You know, they they were concerned about the response from law enforcement and and actually the media coverage of the issues that they were that they were rallying together and protesting. And I think that that's one of the big issues that we've got to understand. Really, people talk so much about fake news in this modern era and the way that media reports things, but really. I think you'd said earlier, to borrow a term, if I may, that you'd used, you refer to being invisibled. And it's what sometimes isn't covered in the media that is the real problem, I think. Absolutely. It's being invisibilized, but also, you know, experiencing what it means to be reported on as a Native person in the the press as, you know, I've seen the use of words savage, off the reservation, um, you know, people that look Indian, um, you know, just this whole trope of these really racist, stereotyped ideals. Um, even when it comes to reporting on something as as exciting and um, you know progressive as our first Native American Congresswoman, you know, the first Native women that are in representing in the U.S. Congress, you read something from the Economist that talks about you know going off the reservation, talks about Deb Haaland looking Native American, and the other one. You know, another Native guy doesn't look Indian at all, you know, and that she's part Indian. Um, just this whole trope of really uh, misconceived ideas and things that haven't been fact-checked either. You know, they're, to use phrases like part Indian um, when, you know, are, are people part American? Are, is citizenship a partial identity? Citizenship is an identity. Um, you are a citizen of your nation or you're not. And, you know, that, that kind of racialized, you know, this is what an Indian should look like. All of those things impact how we view Native people. Uh, the very few times that we are reported on the news, I feel like a lot, a lot of times it's reported in such a manner that's incredibly disrespectful and racist and stereotyped. Tara, did I hear you correctly? Forgive me, guys, because Jason, I know you got a question here. But did I hear you correctly when you said that The Economist reported with the headline, Going Off the Reservation? They even put a big headdress on top of the of, of a drawing of Congress. So, yes. Oh, my God. Ladies and gentlemen, we just had the WTF moment. Jason, I'm sorry. I, I had to just interject there. That is absolutely appalling. Go ahead. Well, no, that's that's the point. And that, that leads to this, this next portion of the conversation is, again, it's that image. And it's it's you see it. You see it all over. It's not just with indigenous people. You see it with anything that has a stereotype attached to it. You get that that sort of approach to it, no matter what it is. And it makes you think about how Native culture has been uh, represented in modern media, movies, entertainment. Um, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, Native Americans being portrayed by white actors. Uh, it goes on and on and on. So... You know, looking at that, you, you have this sort of representation of this is what a native indigenous person is supposed to look like. This is what they are supposed to behave like. And, you know, it's cowboys and Indians in a lot of people's mind, and they just don't have a clear vision of, A, that these people still exist. They're still sovereign nations in many cases, and that they still have traditions and rituals and cultures. And so, you know, Terry, if you could just kind of comment on how the native cultures are represented through entertainment and movies and music and media and what what's the realistic side of what that should be so you i mean it's it's <laughs> i think the the term i've heard used often is um you know feather and leather so you see like the the natives that are on screen are typically in feathers war paint and buckskin um that continues to be the roles that our actors and actresses face um, there is a very, very small, small 
place for anything that's outside of that. And oftentimes it's done by indigenous um, filmmakers and indigenous, uh, you know, artists that are looking to have other forums beyond just like those cow- cowboy and Indian movies. Um, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that that's how we continue to be represented and that the only time you ever see us on the big screen is when someone decides to do a Western. Um, you know, there are no, when you ask people this, you know, how many native commentators do you see on CNN? How many native commentators do you see on MSNBC? Um, how is it that, you know, when there's a native issue that comes up, which typically involves sports mascots, because that's the only time they ever cover our issues is when we're upsetting their football games. You know, how often do you see a native person actually commenting on these things? Or how often do you see oftentimes another person of color, um, which is typically what they tend to do? They'll have someone that's black come in and commentate. They'll have someone that's Latino come in and commentate on an issue affecting the Native American community. Um, you know, that it is mind boggling to me that we do not have any steady form of representation on our television screens when that is such a huge influence in our culture. Um, and that, you know, when you look at the silver screen, it is this continued trope of Westerns and there aren't modern Native folks anywhere to be seen. Um, you know, I would say the closest that we saw maybe was something like Twilight, where you're talking about, you know, a, a, a girl that's in love with vampires and, and werewolves, and we happen to be represented as reservation werewolves, sort of. <laughs> mm. um, you know, but that's about as close as we're getting, and that's, we can do a lot better, um, and we should do a lot better, because I think it would help, you know, not only Native kids, but all other kids, because it's important to acknowledge that not only do these stereotypes hurt us, and hurt the self-esteem of native american youth but it also you know has been proven by these by these associations doing these studies um that those type of stereotype representations not only cause these non-native children to adopt stereotypes about native children but it it encourages them to adopt stereotypes about other races as well Um, you are learning to characterize a race of people as a set of stereotypes and that is behavior that we should not continue to encourage Terrell, we said we would be very respectful with your time. You've already given us so much, and we know that you are actually planning for another rally and your ongoing efforts. So briefly, really quickly, if you can tell us a little bit about how more people out there, if they want to become involved, how they can do so, and where online they can find that information. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's that's like, I would say, a, a really important piece of this whole conversation of, of genocide and of representation and of, you know, the the ills that we're facing today through missing and murdered indigenous women through jurisdictional gaps through lack of economic development it is that you know understanding that genocide although it's no longer called genocide that those policies continue today Um, those policies continue through a number of different means including extractive industry and the impacts it has on our communities Um, extractive industry affects indigenous peoples first and worst um, when pipelines, mines, you know, anything, anything along those lines, oil rigs, all that stuff, when it, when it, when those things happen, it doesn't happen in the backyards of Hollywood. It doesn't happen in the backyards of the suburbs. It happens in the backyards of native people because we're out of sight, out of mind. Um, the places where you can't see. And that means that our communities are impacted first and worst. That means that man camps come in and our women experience increased rates of violence that, from the people who are building the pipeline, from the people who are building the oil rig, from the people who are manning the oil rig. Um, and then all of these jurisdictional gaps, you know, uh, come into play. So I would say, you know, I personally dedicate a, lo- a great deal of my time um, fighting extractive industry, not only for Native people and the protection of our homelands and waters, but also for the protection of all of us. You know, climate change is the single greatest issue facing mankind. I'm currently fighting the Line 3 pipeline. It is a tar sands line proposed to go through the headwaters of the Mississippi River to the shore of Lake Superior. They are putting at risk... a a fifth of the world's fresh water with a million barrel per day tar sands pipeline from Alberta. Um, if you want to learn more about that issue, please visit stopline3.org. Um, you know, check out what's going on, how you can help, you know, as something as simple as, you know, raising the um, issue and, you know, sharing what's going on. But also if you want to come out, if you want to, you know, give your, give your support, um, your physical presence and stand against these industries. You know, we are at a critical time and we are running out of this time. We know it's happening. We know climate change is here. Um, and 
we can no longer be complacent in, in, in hoping that someone else will take care of it. Um, our government systems certainly are not going to and the corporations are not going to either. Special thanks to Tara Hauska and all of our guests, including Dr. Samuel Zinner and, on the first edition of this two-part podcast, Professor Daniele Bellelli, the host of the Drunken Taoist and the History on Fire podcast. Again, Jason, I don't think that we could have had a better gathering of minds for this two-part episode. I learned a lot. And I've got to tell you, that's one of the best things about the Seven Ages Audio Journal for me personally. I've been a podcaster for close to a decade. And of course, prior to ever becoming a podcaster, I worked in broadcast radio, terrestrial radio, for six years. But this show, arguably, I learn more in the prep that I do for this show, especially with the diversity of the guests that we have, and that generally in relation to history and archaeology. You know, so it's still a fairly specific subject a range of subjects that we address and with these two episodes it was a laser focus that we had on that subject of the so-called american holocaust which again we borrowed from david standard's book of the same title and so for the listeners who have stayed with us the entire time it was a monumental undertaking on our part and special thanks to all of you who have listened to all of this two-part series we realize it isn't always a pleasant topic, but it is an important one. And so coming away from projects like this, I know that I have learned something. I hope our listeners feel like they have learned something too, Jason. Well, you know, that's why we do this. And, you know, it's one for the love of history and archaeology and the cultures and everything that you said. And prep for these shows, we learn so much. You know, we come in with a cursory knowledge and we leave, uh, you know, exponentially smarter than when we started. And we hope that that's the same experience for the listeners. Um, This is a passion project for us. We do this because we love it. And ultimately, in the end, we hope that we can give something back to the listeners that, you know, is going to enrich their life and that they can share that knowledge with other people. And especially with regard to this subject, you know, our minds and our hearts go out to the people of North America, the first inhabitants, those who were here when the Spanish arrived and when the myriad multitudes of colonists that arrived thereafter came to this country and claimed land for their own. Again, historically speaking, we need to remember there were people here first, and their history is important too. We hope, above all else, we have done them justice, and that this two-part series, I'm sure it won't be the last that we produce along these lines, but it's very important, it's very meaningful, and it certainly meant a lot to us. We appreciate all of you who have taken time to listen to it because of the weight that goes behind this subject. So again, on behalf of Jason, James, and yours truly, Micah Hanks, we are the Seven Ages Research Associates. You can follow us online at sevenages.org. We'll have this podcast available on YouTube also. Check out our YouTube channel and all social media channels as well for further updates from us. This has been a special undertaking, and Jason, I definitely appreciate your time, effort, and energy put into it also in helping make it happen. Yeah, it's the least I can do. And, you know, all I hope is that people take away something from it. And, you know, I would encourage people to uh, familiarize yourself with these issues because they are going on today. And if you can find a way to get involved, if you can find a way to share this knowledge, share this podcast with people that you know and love and care about, uh, I think we'll all be better for it in the long run. Absolutely. We'll also feature links to related content, reading lists, and things like that on the posts that accompany these two episodes. Again, you can find that at sevenages.org. So if you are a subscriber and you don't regularly visit our website, there will be additional content and details with relation to what we've discussed in these two episodes that you may find interesting. So again, thank you for being along on this journey for us. And thank you, Jason Pentrail, for being my cohort 
As always, as we continue our efforts to understand our past, to enjoy the present, to look ahead to the future with knowledge in our back pocket, on behalf of Jason Pentrail, James Waldo, and yours truly, Micah Hanks, we are the Seven Ages Research Associates, and we will catch you next time right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Journal.